and welcome to episode 29 of On The Bench. On The Bench is the world's only podcast for scale modelers by scale modelers. So if you build aircraft, ships, armor, cars, science fiction subjects, figures, this is the podcast for you. On the Bench is a fortnightly podcast available on iTunes, Stitcher, and all good podcast apps. Don't forget to mark us as your favourite so you never miss a show. And while you're there, leave a rating. That just helps other people find the show as well. If you want to get in contact with us, we'd love to hear from you. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. Firstly, you can send us an email at onthebench64 at gmail.com. Alternatively, just pop in the words on the bench into Facebook and that'll take you directly to our page. On with the show and g'day guys, we've got Ian in the studio, g'day Ian. G'day Dave. And we've got Julian. Hello. And we've got special guest tonight, Robert. G'day Dave, g'day everyone. Robert's here to talk about Japanese models. Japanese aircraft, aircraft yeah, yeah, so Japanese aircraft, yeah. yeah, people, your wait is over. You've been looking <laughs> forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll have a bit of a chat about that uh, later on. But first up, what have you guys been doing in the last couple of weeks since the last episode? Ian, what have you been up to? Well, I had another failure with the um, metal colours on the on the Yunkus. Oh no, what did you do? I have no idea. But it came out all pebbly this time. Ah, no. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've cracked the wobblies. Put it back in the box yep. and took out the old USS England, which I've been working on for the past two and a bit years. Yep. And yeah, hooking into that again. Ah. Julian? Um, <coughs> so I have this uh, Accurate Miniatures Dauntless that I've been working on. And um, it's a, it's an Atelier, Atelier re- reboxing. Yep. But um, the moulds have, have De- been w- worn down. Yeah, <laughs> and um, there's a lot of flash and... Um, there was warping in the fuselage, and uh, I tell you, what, I'm putting the, the wings on, and it's not it's not fun at so all. So, what was the first time when you opened up the box that gave you a hint that is going to be one of those models? Oh, that when, you? when when I started uh, clipping off pieces for the that go on so, uh, either side of the fuselage on the inside, you know, yep. for the cockpit. Yeah. And uh, you know, there are there are you know, fl- you know, little sticks and things, you know, throttle controls and stuff that are. Just covered in flash and I cleaned it so, up so best. As soon as I saw the flash, that'd be it. I'd, I'd close a box and go, nah. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, like I'm at the point that I am now where I've already closed up the fuselage, I'm still thinking of whether I should just put it back in the box and never touch it again, give it to uh, someone. You, you've gone to the hard part, mate, finish it off. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the other, I do want to, to build within this year I, um, uh, another an, an American Navy World War II plane. Yep. And I was thinking about doing the Devastator. Yep. Because there's an, uh, a reason, quite a nice kit. But then you know, I heard some things that it's quite uh, a pain in the ass to build, despite being a nice kit, because it's got those corrugated wings. And you've got to clean up the wing at uh, the leading edge, right? Because the ribs go over the leading edge. They do, edge. yes. And I just thought, oh, that sounds like a lot of trouble <laughs> that I'm not willing to go to. <laughs> we should go buy a special tool to do it, couldn't you? Yeah. A special tool. You love tools. It's called sandpaper. I, yeah, I, I know. There's, there's no, there's no <laughs> special tool. If there was, I'd buy it. <laughs> I like tools. <laughs> oh dear. Well, I took a whole week off work with the intention of just spending it building models, and so Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday had a bit of a disaster with a um, submarine I'm building. It's um, building a USS um, Gatto, which is an AFV club model. And I thought oh, I'll try the oils, the oils method of um, of doing your filtering. So got it out. Uh, I I finished the model. I put a nice clear coat on it. Then got the oils out. And I thought because last time I did the oils, I actually used um, turpentine, and that was a disaster. So this time I thought oh, I'll be smart. I'll use 
methylated spirits. <laughs> on acrylic paint. Bom bom. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Stripped all the paint off in blotches left, right and centre. It all gunked up, so I'm um, just going to have to strip the kit back and start again. Or you know what? Even just maybe because they're so cheap to go and buy another one and start from scratch. I don't know. No, no, do that. Do that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too, yeah. So much easier. I'm un- unlike Ian who, who persists with a dog. <laughs> I'm stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking hmm, lesson learned maybe. And next time I'll just go back to the tried and true method of using, I don't know, powders and Ian's method of filtering. Yep. So... Yep. <laughs> Let's see how I go. Nah, nah. Stick with what you know. So that was Tuesday had that disaster. Then Wednesday, the modelling gods were definitely unkind to me because I came down with man flu. So <laughs> I laid on the couch dying from Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and haven't really started feeling good until today actually. And today's Wednesday, so a good week I've been sort of laid up yep. and just feeling sorry for myself. I'd just like to say man flu is a real thing. Oh, yeah, I know. There's been a report on it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We're not just whiners. No, we're not. <laughs> we're genuinely sick. <laughs> well, I was genuinely sick, so um, I got a little bit done on my aircraft carrier USS Independence. So I managed to get the flight deck all sanded down, ready for the um, um, deck that I'm going to put on top of it, which is one of those um, paper wooden decks. Yes. Already pre-coloured from Pontos. Models. Pontos, yes. Um, so I did get some done and the hulls together, although I got a lot of work on the hull. The hull's really fighting me at the moment, so I've got a bit of sort of sanding and and work to do there. But I'll, I'll get there eventually. Yep. I was just gutted about my submarine. Cause I, I, live cause and learn, I, mate. I, you live and learn. Because I bought the new, these new oils and they're, well, they're not new, they're um, against the German word, so Arbeitung. 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 Try Abtilung. That's the one. Thank you. And it was a naval naval and grey effects set. And I thought, oh, it looks really awesome. I'll try that. And I was so excited. And I've just been gutted now. I think what I need to do is get a... Um, I've got an old model ship kit. And I'm going to use that as a, my test bed for um, getting the method Good right. Good idea. Yeah. Good so idea. So that's been my week, which has been an unmitigated disaster. But yep. never mind. <laughs> what about you, Robert? What have you been up to? Well, even I'm here to speak about Japanese aircraft, I also have a sideline of armour. And I've been building four uh, t- Dragon T-34s. And as I go along, I'm learning. So I now know how to build the kit. Now I'm on my fourth one. So I've learned <laughs> all the problems. So uh, <laughs> things are finally going. And amazingly enough, I'm enjoying it. So well, tell me, uh, are, the, are, the, are the tracks, <laughs> are the tracks um, individual links or but are they? They are individual links, but I haven't got to the tracks yet. I'm ah, not see, I would have tackled them first and got them out of the way. No, you've got to put the wheels on it. The tr- you're hard to... Not work it where to put the tracks. No, I would have made the tracks first, right. and then and then sort of link them up last. I'm actually trying uh, Julian's method for this one, which is to just not attach, not glue the wheels on first. Just put the wheels on, and then glue the tracks to the wheels, and then you can take them off for painting. Yep. Because you do know that I'm an expert in um, in armor now. I've heard this. <laughs> <laughs> you have one kit under your belt, and you're full on expert. Well, you got to finish it first. So you can't really call yourself it's an expert. It's finished. Well, it's painted. Well, it hasn't come out the factory yet, so it's finished, technically. So they built them in grey styrene, did they? Well, almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, that's the week. So <laughs> how about we roll right into it and we'll take a very short break and then we'll see what's new in the modelling world. And we're back with what's new in the modelling world. And first off, let's have a look at what Hasegawa has got to offer us for August. And first cab off the rank is the VF-31F. Siegfried. Uh, yes, it's a Macross Delta, the movie. It's appeared in one of oh, those. Hang on. What's it called? A Mesa Hayate. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not okay. familiar with okay, this at, but, at all. Hang it's on. It's basically um, a Hang on. A the young, member, the young member in the studio. It, it's a fictional <laughs> thing. It's made from a, a TV show or movie. Uh, in this case, movie, right? But yeah, it's it's fictional. It's so like one of those robot things, is it? Mm. Sort of, yeah. It's uh, basically like a jet that turns into a robot. Oh, I see. Nice looking model kit, though. In one seventy second scale, comes with a number of parts, and we're also having a look here at some photos of the actual parts, and they're very crisp. What you'd expect from Hasegawa, but um, yeah, it looks like it'd be a fun build. You could have an awesome time with that, and sort of make it up in your own sort of colours if you didn't want to be true to the movie. 
Mm. Next off, the cab off the rank, uh, we have a Volkswagen Beetle uh, in 124th scale. Oh, moon equipped. Oh, I saw that actually a couple of uh, last week. Yeah, mm. number of parts 82, um, model length is 171 millimetres. And it's bright yellow with big moon rim eyes on the side. Beautiful looking bonnet. kit. Absolutely right. gorgeous looking kit. If you're into that thing. Well, I think there'd be quite a lot of um, VW enthusiasts out there who would uh, jump at people. Hasigau also do the combi van with the uh, moon equipped. Oh, do they really? As well, yes. 82 parts would make it a curbside too, I guess, wouldn't it? Mm, mm, oh, yeah, I guess so. It's not saying that it isn't or isn't. Um, next one, in 112th scale, we have the Yamaha YZR500. The Lucky Strike Team, Roberts, 1989 from the Halcyon days. Of MotoGP back in the late eighties. I I have to say I, I always like motorsport when it's got the uh, the old cigarette company <laughs> uh, sponsoring. <Yeah. laughs> um, this was a um, I used to sit up and watch um, the motorcycle races back in the eighties and on, and uh, Team Roberts. Well, Roberts himself was a fantastic uh, motorcycle rider. I think he's a world champion as well in his own right until he had the accident which left him a paraplegic. Then he went on to um, form his own motorcycle team. But getting back to this kit, um, this is a gorgeous rendition of um, his Yamaha motorcycle and the decals and the attention to detail just looks absolutely superb. And this will make a uh, motorcycle builder very happy to have this kit in their collection. So go and have a look at that. Uh, next one is the E4B Nightwatch, which is a jumbo jet in one two hundred scale, but not just any jumbo jet. Um, the E4B Nightwatch is an aircraft that conducts military and government officials in the air when they face difficult situations on the ground. Is that if there's an atomic attack, is it? Well, any sort of attack. That right. sort of put them up in that. When Godzilla comes a-knocking. Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> So used by the USAF, uh, United States Air Force. Um, again, it's would have it's had a bit of a crossover appeal between the airline builders and the military builders actually as well. So it um, in one what did I say one one forty fourth scale one two hundred one two hundred scale. Beg your pardon. So price is about four hundred four thousand two hundred yen, which I don't know what that equates to. In anyone else, just go and have a look up on your uh, calculator for prices. Uh, model length, 350mm, wingspan, 298 Beautiful white um, overall model with a nice uh, dark blue stripe going down the side. So that should make a fantastic kit. Next, in 124th scale, we have the Jaguar XJ-SC V12 convertible. Never one of my favourite Jags. Um, this is their uh, Cabriolet um, style body. Um, I no, I was a big fan of this. Yeah, yuck. Yeah, it wasn't one of the better <laughs> Jag. It was. Uh, parts number is ninety eight. Uh, again, this I think this will be a curbside also, meaning that you can't pose it with the bonnet open and not showing the engine. I guess. Um, length one hundred eighty five millimeters and width seventy five point five. Actually, I think you're reading the specs to the Subaru. No, yes, I was. I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> the next kit is the Subaru Impreza WRC 2005. Gee, uh, it has to go really on a um, car and motorcycle kick at the moment. Well, they, they do like their rally cars, that's for sure. Yep. Uh, so, 124th scale uh, Subaru Impreza in uh, its 2005 Rally Japan uh, livery. And I'll go back and say at parts count of 94, it's probably just a curbside one. Rightio, next off we have a, in 135th scale, a Hitachi Construction Machinery Wheel Loader, i.e. a front-end loader, basically. Um, it's a digger. Yeah, it, as I said, front-end front end loader, um, it's... You know what? These sort of models are sort of mainly the sort of domain of your uh, diecast kits. Yep. More so than mind sort of you, I've seen models. a few of them done up and really nicely weathered, and they look quite good. Yeah, I think I think there's actually quite a lot of following for them now. There's mm. a lot of people that are really getting into, um, you know, construction type vehicles because 
there are actual examples that are locally found that you can use for the weathering. Oh, okay. Right? It's not like tanks where you sort of got to, fi- you know, sort of, you know, think about how it would, would it, how it would weather and maybe look at some photos that, um, yeah. special examples of them being... Plus you could make it into a pretty decent post-apocalyptic zombie crusher. <laughs> <laughs> of course you could. Uh, the beauty about this model, um, the actual bucket comes in uh, a various range of styles that it can be sort of posed in. And the kit is actually articulated between the front wheels and the rear wheels. So you can sort of move it around. And it looks like the wheels can also uh, be posed in movable sort of fashion as well. You could play with it. <laughs> yeah, watch bits <laughs> fall off. Mm. <laughs> uh, next cab off the rank, uh, still with Hasegawa, is the UH-60J Maritime Self-Defence Force um, helicopter of the 72nd Air Corps. This is in 172nd scale and parts number about 109 pieces. Helicopters don't look good in 72nd scale. Too darn small, I reckon. Oh, no, to be in a bigger scale. It's a decent sized copter, though. Well, the, the problem is the footprint, right? Because yeah. even though the fuselage is relatively small, you've got, you've those, got those big those, blades. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It just takes up so much space. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely going to do it. Um, this comes, the decal marking for this is um, the Amura Air Base. Operating core, th- corp, core, I should say. Opening uh, core. Fifty eighth anniversary coating, i.e., and you also get um, decals to do the Tokyo Shimura Air Aviation Remote Tank Air Base Opening Corp. Fifty fifth anniversary. I don't make a complete hash of all that, I think. <laughs> 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 so let's move on, and that's all we got from Hassie Gower. Next up, uh, from Freedom Model Kits, this is uh, one out of the box, which came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, they've announced that they're going to be doing a 135th scale Nike Hercules missile with a movable monorail launcher. Monorail. <laughs> monorail? Monorail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, the... F- this uh, the Nike Hercules is actually a uh, air-to-surface nuclear-tipped um, anti-aircraft missile, so which quite impressed me. Uh, the fact that the uh, you'd want to be launching nukes <laughs> up in the atmosphere, but still, I guess if you're expecting waves of Soviet uh, aircraft to come over the um, horizon, that's uh, one way of taking them all out, I guess. Um, so Ravel actually did one uh, some time ago in one one forty scale. And it looks like now, obviously, that uh, Freedom's going to revisit this particular kit uh, in 135th scale. So looking at some of the CAD drawings that we've um, been given, it's looking like it will make quite an interesting-looking kit for those of you who enjoy this type of modelling. Well, at least it's in 35th scale. Yes, absolutely. 140th scale, what an odd scale. Yeah, See, there's Ravel again with their weird scales. Yeah, but look when it was bought out. That was yeah. bought out in the time when you built... To the box scale. Still weird. <laughs> Don't get me on that soapbox again about weird scale. <laughs> okay, next from Bronco, we've got a new kit announcement for August. This is a German Panzerkampfwagen 2 Flame. Oh, that's the Flum Panzer. That's spectacular box art too. Mm. It's extremely good <laughs> it's box art. It's got so much fire. <laughs> <laughs> Wall of fire. Well, it's shooting fire and it's also got fire behind it. <laughs> yep. So this is coming out in, what scale did I say? One 35th. 35th scale. So for those of you who are dead keen on collecting your German armour, this is definitely one for your collection. Especially early war armour. Yeah. Um, let's have a quick look at what's in the kit. That's uh, not really telling me too much more. Or oh, we're looking at some CAD pictures there. And it looks, the CAD pictures make it look like it's going to be a... Doesn't look like there's too much photo etch. Oh, there'll be a bit of photo etch around. Come here. on, it's Bronco. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the photo bron- etch and lots and lots of pieces. <laughs> lots of pieces, yes. <laughs> but, I mean. There we go. So, in the CAD mock ups, we're actually showing where the photo etch and features in the kit near and completion will be. So, all around the tar openings, perhaps. There's quite a bit on the back. Yeah. Great little kit. Next, uh, keep your eyes peeled for when that's going to be released. Perhaps go to Bronco's model website for more information. Next up, a company called Orange Hobby. Um, They've announced they're doing the USS Boston, uh, which is a 1956 cruiser. 
The interesting thing about this, it was the halfway point uh, between when um, the ships were going from just using main armament um, cannons, I guess, and starting to have missiles actually fitted to them. So this is the 1956 version of the USS Boston, and pity it's in 1700 scale, but never mind, I'm quite sure there's a, there's a huge audience out there who do enjoy that scale, and this is going to make a gorgeous rendition of that particular ship. What are, what are Orange Hobby like for ship models? Really good. I've, no. I've had a couple of theirs. Don't um, they do Australian subjects as well? They do. They do the um, LHDs, the Canberra, Canberra and Adelaide, HMS Canberra, mm-hmm. HMS Adelaide. Um, again, only currently in, in 1700 scale. They also do the Anzac class um, frigates in 1700 scale. Yep. And, oh, beg your pardon, do they do the frigates? I don't know. Ooh. No, I might have to backpedal on that. <laughs> I'm sure that um, some of our Aussie builders out there will uh, be able to probably screaming into their uh, in their speakers because I should know this. <laughs> oh, we'll just have to ask our, our oh. someone who's been on here before, Callum. Yeah. He'll know. <laughs> he will oh, indeed. We can't all know everything. Um, but I've got a couple of the other subjects that Orange Hobby do and their resin's really nice and mm. holds the paint well, very little flash, fits together really well and generally comes with quite uh, a nice amount of etch too. So yep. you, don't, you don't have to go and buy anything. Everything's already in yes. the kit for you. So, which is uh, really cool, I reckon. That's it from me for what's new. What about you guys? You guys get any new? Oh, have you heard of any new models or kits coming out? Or? No, this is the part where we sort of go and shrug our shoulders and say, <laughs> <laughs> "Don't know anything." Oh, hang on, oh, Robert, 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 yeah. I actually Robert do know something. Uh, AMG uh, Dora kits from I think Ukraine are bringing out a forty-eight scale Hawker Hart, uh, which is like a, a uh, between the wars biplane bomber. Yep. And I think it's going to be really popular. Uh, uh, AMG do quite nice stuff. And uh, th- it's this will be super popular with people who love RAF and also people that like RAAF because AMG, as they usually do, make multiple versions of things. And RAAF had the Demon Fighter, so that should be popular amongst Ooh, Australian models. Hawker Demon. Yeah. I'll be getting one of them. The Heart and the Demon were classic sort of the old biplanes that are just yeah. starting to come into the sort of the modern era. Yeah, the old silver ones. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Oh, um, did they have much rigging on them? Oh, of course they would have. Yeah. And interestingly, we spoke to <laughs> Wingnut Wings, what, two episodes ago? So they're not sort of touching the end of the market because no. they're just concentrating on their World War One stuff. So. Well, plus it's the wrong scale for them. True. The wrong scale? Yeah, 48. Yeah. 48. Oh, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. yeah. There is a 30-second scale one in resin from, I think, Silver Wings. That's beautiful but also very pricey. Oh, it would be pricey. Yeah, I've seen it? one. <laughs> also, while I'm here, um, AMG, yeah, I think it's AMG, are also bringing out a 48 scale, I think it's out, out now, uh, Polycarp of R5 Natasha, which is, a, a, I suppose, the Russian analogue to the Hawker Heart. Yep. It's oh. a, another sort of uh, pre-war biplane. It's a massive thing. It's a huge aeroplane. So I've seen photographs of, of th- and the pilots look like children sitting in it. It's uh, so big. <laughs> 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 ah, lovely. That's oh. not very nice. That could be just, you know, short. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that just about wraps up what's new. Um, obviously, if you guys hear anything out there, um, please drop us a line and you can contact us via email on the bench 64 at gmail.com or just leave a comment or message on our Facebook page. Back shortly with our chat with Robert on Japanese aircraft. Okay, we're back now with Robert, and Robert's here in the studio tonight to tell us about um, Japanese aircraft, because you're a bit of a expert on it. Well, experts a lot. I have been just doing it for a long time. Well, that makes you an expert in my, an expert in my book. Well, <laughs> you're, a, you're a local expert. <laughs> well, maybe, but yeah. I sort of feel my, my sort of certainty of knowledge has been a bit like a bell curve. Yep. You start off and you, you learn a lot, yep. and you hit a point where you think you know quite a bit. And then you realise you know less and less and less and less. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, the, the more you drill down into little details and facts, the more you sort of end up going, okay, well, in this case it's like this and in this case it's like that, but no one really knows. And <laughs> Whenever people ask me questions, particularly about colours, it's just me equivocating the whole time. You know, it could be this and it could be that, who knows? You know. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. Well, I'll... Um 
pop a couple of leading questions out there. Okay. So what do you mainly prefer to build in what scale? Uh, 48 scale. Um, when I first started out, I would buy any anything, but I eventually decided 48 is the best scale. Yep. So for me at least anyway. And is there a particular brand that um, you sort of continue to lean towards or you just whatever subject sort of grabs you in that within that genre of the of Japanese aircraft? Well, basically for Japanese aircraft, um, Tamiya and particularly Hasegawa are the big makers. Yep. And I, I really, I like, Hasegawa doesn't tend to fit as well and they can make some rather big mistakes in shapes. Yep. But I really love their surface de- detail mm. and also they've given us a lot more kits than Tamiya. But mm. there's a new player on the block called Wingsy Kits. And uh, they've done the Claude, the A five M. I haven't heard of them. Uh, yeah, they're, they're oh, from they're beautiful. Ukraine. Yeah, and beautiful kits. I think this. I saw one. I actually don't have one yet, but um, I I saw saw some that did have one. Oh, it's almost like the best kit I've ever seen in forty eight scale. It's Seriously, it is that good. And it's their first kit. So what's the name of the company again? Wingsy Kits. Wingsy. Yeah. W i n g s y s y. And they've got a cute little sort of a hummingbird logo in nice colours. I like everything about them. <laughs> 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 yeah, I saw um, the other day on I can't remember what brand it was, but it was a um, a Perry. Oh yes, from Fine Molds. Yeah, it is another scale. beautiful kit. Yeah, I yeah. thought, oh, that looks quite attractive. Biplane. Mm. But see, before World War Two. Yeah, but see these names like the Perrys and the Claude. They're the actual Allied designations right, of the yeah. aircraft, mm. aren't they? Much like uh, when um, NATO was facing off against Russia, we used to call. The aircraft, you know, like the flogger and the the faggot, the faggot, mm. and uh, <laughs> what was it? Some of the other ones, uh, full bed, full yeah, yep. all those sorts of mm. things. So they're actually um, westernised sort of naming conventions uh, for the aircraft. That's right, because the, the, there was so little known at the time uh, by the Allies that they they didn't know what the planes were, and the Japanese tended to call them like Type ninety seven attack uh, bomber. And this sort of didn't uh, roll off the tongue for the Americans, so they came up with a simple uh, system of using like boys' names for fighters and girls' names for bombers. Uh, so it was just simple for them. Oh, a light bulb's looking off of my head. Yes, of course, like the Betty Bomber and, and oh, yeah. oh, okay, and Betty the Val named, yeah. Dive Bomber. Betty named after an Australian nurse. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Mm. So, did the Japanese ever sort of uh, put? Um, Names to their aircraft that had serial number or call them by a number. Later on, I mean, did they call it like Falling Blossom or something like well, that? Well, sometimes, particularly later on, they'd get names like Violet Lightning and Painted Cloud and things like that. Which, mm. uh, the names. Well, there's a manly name, isn't it? Painted, Painted Cloud. Cloud. Yeah. Wonder what that, could that be? The Mert, I wonder. Oh, it is. Is it? I think it might be. <laughs> 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 Makes sense to me now. But it's a beautiful aeroplane. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> yes, Robert. <laughs> 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 The running joke. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's come to a head now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to front up now. <laughs> yeah, but there were some other names like um, the Jap- the uh, Oscar, we call a Key 43. Um, that that was uh, called the Hayabusa, um, mm. which means Peregrine Falcon. And that was sort of before they were getting uh, con- naming conventions. But they would also th- call things like the, um, the Lily Bomb was called the Seiki, which w- uh, was a contraction of a few words which meant a l- uh, light twin. So oh, right, yep. Okay. Mm. Light body, twin engine. Mm, yeah. One of the difficulties, I think, with um, Japanese aircraft, I think you came across it when you were trying to paint the Japanese aircraft with the yellow leading edge. Oh, yeah, the yellow leading edges, yeah. The colour photographs are lacking, uh, well, any sort of documentation in sort of the colour area is lacking, so you face a pretty steep sort of learning curve in that area just to start with. Well... The, Robert is my go-to source for a lot of the colour call-outs for, Jap- for the f- what few Japanese planes I've been working on mm. lately. Um, but, you know, like he says, there's, there's, there's examples and then there's opinions. And Where do you go, Robert, for your... Um well, I, ha- I do have a rather large selection of uh, Japanese uh, books. Uh, most of them, like my favourite ones, The Famous Aircraft of the World, which are basically magazines... And they're, they're really cheap. They have all the photographs that really exist of Japanese aircraft. Unfortunately, it's not like the Germans where every soldier had a, had a, a camera and could take photographs. Mm. There, there's just not that many photographs of things. Uh, so th- they're really good. And there's also uh, maroon mechanics, which ha- give you lots of uh, detail on the interiors of things. But for colour, um, that's where it gets really difficult. Uh, for a long time, we didn't even 
know what the colours were. There was no Japanese RLM guide like uh, you get for the Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe. Yep. So, but luckily we did, did actually, or I, I, I say we, we didn't find it. Somebody found the, the actual uh, one document that had some colours in. And uh, generally people have been using uh, relics mm-hmm. and descriptions uh, of things and uh, they sort of match them against the FS fans that uh, the US use a lot, which is not a lot of good to us in Australia because we can't get them. Yep. But luckily there's an Australian guy called Ian K. Baker yes. who uh, put out a set of colouring chips, actual uh, paint chips, and uh, while the, the names have changed, the colours have been, been pretty pretty good, so I sort of use, base a lot of my stuff on, on those colour chips. Yeah, apparently his, his little magazine book is extremely hard to get your hands on now. I'm glad I've got one. Yeah. It cost me about $11 <laughs> at the time. Yeah, it'd be well over $100 well, now. Yeah, it'd be worth it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And of course then with, uh, as the Japanese got sort of later into the war, I mean you have all the issues where they weren't using proper undercoat on their aircraft and you see the sort of the bare metal sort of coming through and... Yes, Just Robert. Let, let's hear what you have to say about uh, <laughs> chipping on Japanese planes. Yes. No, this is a good, be a good conversation. Uh, this one of the things as a if you're a Japanese modeler, yep. it just drives you nuts when you see something like a Sayram, the M6A1, which is a, a float plane late in the war. Float planes always pop, were painted properly because they go in salt water. Yep. And they were like a month old, and people will have it chipped with like only about a third of the paint still left on it. Mm. It's just it's ridiculous. So I will say, look at photographs because, yep. uh, especially early in the war, um, Japanese stuff was painted really well. These were aircraft that were meant to last. They w- wasn't a case of, oh, well, it's only going to last a few months. They expect it to last a long time. So they were painted really well, and if the Japanese aircraft were primed, uh, which they were till uh, about late 1943, the paint stayed on really well. In fact, there's a, there's a famous book about uh, Jap- uh, about aircraft wrecks, wrecks in the Pacific in the Pacific. And Charles Darby, the guy that wrote that, said, if you come across an aircraft out in the, in the Pacific that is in good condition, it's Japanese. Is it fair to say that the Japanese Navy sort of paid more attention to their aircraft in regards to the painting than, say, the Japanese Army did? Well, because of that particular reason, because they're exposed to salt more off, more so than the land-based aircraft? I, I sort of feel the Navy was a bit more of a professional operation all round. <laughs> but uh, but the, when when uh, aircraft came from the factory... We need to army, talk about Midway soon. Okay, in that right. case. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when, when they came from the army, they were especially fighters, they were sent in, in aluminium and yep. were then uh, either camouflaged in the field or at the depot. So they weren't primed. Okay. So that they it tends to be army aircraft in the early days that did, did chip. But then again, American aircraft... I remember seeing a photograph in the Philippines of a P-35 and I've never seen such bad chipping on a plane. Mm. It was because it was aluminium in that area, just painted straight over the aluminium. Just paint doesn't stick to it. No, that's right. You can't edge to it. Mm. Same with models. Yeah, well, that's because (laughs) you use the wrong oils and everything when you sort of... (laughs) 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 Yep. Uh, Dude... Are you are you mainly sort of focused on fighters, or you do fighters and bombers and dive bombers and float planes? Is there a particular sort of niche that you zeroed in on? It's part of the pun. Well, zeroed in on, or it, it used to be everything, but yeah. now sort of uh, focused on the navy more. Uh, I don't know why. Just mm. I've got more more kits, and uh, that's the sort of. Thi- uh, I'm just think the na- as I said, the navy was a bit more professional, and I think their aircraft tended to be a bit better. You get a, a scale preference yeah, now? As I, as so I said earlier, 48. Yep. For, for yep. I, I, you know, I would buy, I was trying to collect every Japanese aircraft at one point, which meant going into 48, into 70 second scale, but I just decided. You no. must have a huge stash. Well, I used to, but I <laughs> sold off a lot of it. I, all the 70 second scale stuff went. Yeah. And I had a, a bit of a big, a big uh, kit sell off, and uh, all, most of the army stuff went then as well. Mm. Bombers, you got any bombers in, in your collection at all? Um, because they've always fascinated me, the Japanese bombers, and well, not just the bombers so much, but they had a completely different philosophy when it came to aircraft, say, against what the Allies did. They weren't concerned about um, self-fueling, uh, self-sealing fuel tanks. They weren't concerned about um, armour protection in it all. Their job was just to carry the bomb from point A to point B and drop it and get there as fast as possible and do that, and as, as long distance as possible and do that. They just cut the weight down and didn't worry about all those creature comforts, I guess you'll call it. Uh, yeah, for one of the things I've learned about Japanese aircraft is that range was paramount for them. Mm. They just had to outrange the opposition. Uh, but some of the problem about uh, uh, 
armour and self, with self-sealing fuel tanks, the Japanese industry was sort of like there was basically the military industry and not much else. So they had had more difficulty coming up with things like rubber sheeting for, for covering of uh, fuel tanks. But th- they understood it, but they generally didn't have... They were usually about 200 horsepower down on uh, US aircraft. Mm. And certainly the designers knew about adding uh, armour and, and fuel tank protection, but they just didn't have the more powerful enough engines. And the, and the Navy were, j- were just saying to them, we want more range, that's what we want. So, so that's an interesting point then. Was it the lack of power in the engines that sort of prevented them from putting those additional things into the aircraft? or Generally, yep. yeah. Because when you think about the Zero, it had to do incredible things on 950 horsepower. Hmm. And uh, there's just no way they could they could put uh, armour and, and fuel tank protection. But the bit of a philosophy for the Japanese was we we really trained well, we're really good, we're not going to get hit, we're going to hit them. Hmm. So Until midway. Well, yeah, Japanese... <laughs> that kind of just destroyed everything. Yeah, it's wishful thinking. Yeah. When you read about Japanese mm. aircraft and naval operations, it's just wishful thinking right the way through. Yeah, glass yeah. confidence. Yeah, well, yeah. I think it's fair to say the Japanese were still fighting the last war that they had against the Russians back in 1901, 1905, beg your pardon. Um, and you could see that sort of, you know, that that great big battle sort of mentality sort of permeating its way through the fleet. Um, and then with the, the early time. conquest in China. Yeah, uh, yes, yes. And, and 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 the early wins against they had against the Allies, I guess that gave them a false sense of security as they moved forward um, into the rest of the war. Oh, for sure. Um, and they didn't. the other thing was they didn't have the depth um, in their uh, pilot training, um, in their production of um, aircraft and also ships for that matter to sort of make up for any losses that would come to in, in the future. Yeah, I'd dispute the depth of the pilot training because their pilots were trained ridiculous amount. No, no, I meant the depth as in those coming through the follow-up oh, yeah. to take up for losses. Well, the, problem, yeah. the problem was that it was just so hard to become a pilot and the standards were so high that they couldn't train enough people at that rate. Oh, okay, so it was a real elitist yeah. thing. and it was so ridiculous. I read one account of a po- – it was like the, the – just before the cer- ceremony of uh, the pilots passing out, mm. so one of the pilots did something that upset someone. So he was just washed out, sent back to be a sailor. Oh Went wow. through the entire training, yep. had done it all, passed everything. Too bad, out you go. Don't don't fit our health. <laughs> a bit <standards>. harsh. <laughs> it was. <laughs> no, mate, the Japanese Navy, they were punching people. And yeah, yeah, they were very yeah. brutal. Bat- bats and stuff. Yep. Yeah. Very brutal sort of regime. Mm. So um, back to the modelling side of it. Okay. Um, do you, do you, is there any sort of uh, hurdles that you can think of, like specific ones to certain aircraft? Well, I think the biggest hurdle for all Japanese uh, building is those yellow leading edges. Ah. Honestly, you talk to people that build Japanese uh, aircraft, doing those yellow leading edges is just really difficult. I, t- I sort of, because I'm stupid, instead I should, mas- should paint them yellow first and then mask up, but I think, no, they would have been painted That's what I originally do. with the other paints and then painted over the top, so I sort of thought, I have to do it that way. Mm. So... I mean, he's putting a white base coat down. Well, I usually don't. I mm. Usually I find if I just spray yellow, it's okay. Yep. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't add something else I have to do. Things <laughs> <laughs> so why did the Japanese have that yellow leading edge? Is that an aircraft recognition thing? Yeah, or? simply that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know how effective it was. Well, I mean, the Allies did similar things. The Australians painted all their tails of their aircraft white. And the leading edges. And the leading edges white as well, yeah. And the Brits also on some of the late war. Aircraft typhoons and so forth have yep. yellow leading edges as well. Maybe it worked. Mm. Well, well, I, well, one thing that I found that's a bit difficult is because um, I, I, I started building this uh, this twin engine uh, fighter, um, and the problem I found was n- trying to find out where the yellow leading edge terminates just before the fuselage. Like, does it come right up to it, or does it end in a vertical line? And I found it very difficult to find photos of it because on twin engine planes, the engine covers that from yeah, almost uh, every yeah, angle. Photo, yeah. yep. Right? Unless you get it from, str- from directly ahead, in which case, you know, you still can't see things. You can't tell if it's... Or indeed, was the paint actually between the uh, engine nacelle and the fuselage? Maybe it wasn't. It was. It was? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I, f- I find one of the most annoying things in photographs is people standing in front of what you want to see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all can agree so with that. Get out of the way! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> true. <laughs> Too true on that one. 
But an, another big problem with Japanese aircraft is the colours. Mm. Uh, I was saying a little bit earlier it was hard to know. But originally, when I first started out, the colour for the Zero, which is now like an olive grey, we believe now, at the time, there was basically one document about that said that these these Zeros are painted J3 towards Ame Iro. Now, we didn't know what J3 was. <laughs> Ame Iro was, was caramel colour. Now... Finally, someone found one of these docu- a document, which was uh, the Kariki 117, which is a, a, a document which was a revision to a 1938 document, and it had all the, the Japanese colours in. And it was a, bit, a little bit like an RLM thing. It was like a fan of colours. And suddenly we were going get to get to see this. So finally they, they bring this, have this, this colour chart thing out, and it's missing one colour card. <laughs> which is J3. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, oh, that was the end. But, but because people finally un- understood th- th- this document exists, yep. the paint companies had them. And it was at the, at the Diet, uh, the Japanese Diet Library, the mm. uh, Parliament Library. And uh, so they finally found them and they found the other ones with this J3. But the J3 turns up, it's not the colour we all expected. It wasn't this olivey grey colour. It was just a straight out black and white grey. And uh, this is caused... Right. Ever since, we, we don't know. Apparently, the colour that they used didn't exist anywhere in a colour chart. Wow. Oh. It's uh, amazing. I still I can't get my head around it still. So And there's there's lots of talk about it. Like one of the... Uh, if you're looking, if looking for info on Japanese aircraft, um, uh, Nick Millman, uh, he's an English bloke. He's, I don't know how he's in such an expert, but he knows just about everything there is to know about Japanese colours. And uh, even he can't be totally certain about things because it's just the information doesn't seem to be there mm. so it's really really frustrating mm. yeah I, i've been on that website and it's actually really interesting he'll show like certain like if you look up a certain color that you think your plan is supposed to be he'll show a version of it where it's he thinks it's fresh a version of it where he thinks it's faded a version of it where it's oxidized and some of them some of these paints will get darker over time and lighter over time so it's really all over the place. Yeah, the thing, thing Nick upsets a lot of people because he won't. People say, "What color paint do I use? What brand of paint do I use?" He won't. He won't, he won't tell them. Yep. He says he gives he gives you the facts and lets you make up your own mind. Yep. And some people get really upset. One guy had a blog having a go at, at him over. <laughs> 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 That's time better spent modelling. So That's right. Does that mean then you can be you get a lip? bit more of a free hand in choosing the sort of colour that you eventually settle on for your for your aircraft kit? Some would say yes. Yeah. I might say no. <laughs> <laughs> it just means there's a lot of kits you just can't build at the moment. Well, a little bit like that because I feel I want certainty about things. And yep. like For instance, there's a sort of idea that some Japanese planes were painted blue and there's reports saying we saw a blue plane and some guy said we painted a plane blue but there's no evidence for it. So and if they did, what type of blue was it? Well, that's just it. Yeah. Um, there's actually colour. Well, we probably do have a, some idea because the, in the, uh, the the documents we have now, there are blues, but we don't know which blue it would have been. Mm. But we don't know for certain if it was actually done. Mm. It's just people talking about things. But sometimes that can sort of, y- y- the evidence will come up. Because for a long time, there was a, I think it was the 29th Sentai, an army unit, had like a, a wave marking that went to a point on the, on the fuselage, quite an attractive marking. And there were reports of this and... Uh, people had done drawings, but there was no evidence. But suddenly, a couple of years ago, there was a, a picture of an aircraft wreck, like actually a whole bunch of aircraft wrecks, mm. and there's the tail of a Tojo, K-44, with the marking on it. Wow. So it did actually, uh, yep. actually exist. No but one was standing in front of it? Uh, <laughs> amazingly enough, no. <laughs> <laughs> and do they know the colour of the marking? Well, it looks like it could be yellow, but yellow. then you get orthographic film. Is it yellow? Is it exactly. something Exactly. Well, didn't they have that same problem with the um, KI-61? The, uh, they thought it was a chocolate colour at one stage. Well, yeah. Well, or the big green sham- sham- yeah. they re- Was the shamrock real? Well, we don't know. Yeah. Because there's one photograph of that aircraft from a, an angle. Yep. And I've seen people try and stretch the photograph around and <laughs> come up with some idea. But shamrocks don't exist in Japan. Japan, yeah, so which made it really weird. Yeah, so people come up with all sorts of ideas. But again, no one knows. So my feeling would be there are plenty of key 61s Don't do that one. Yep. <laughs> but as far as, <laughs> as far as the brown goes, we sort of have an idea what that is now because yep. uh, some of the documents were found late war aircraft after, I think, usually by October 
in 1944, yep. the order went out to paint everything a uh, colour called Yellow Green Number 7. Now, Yellow Green Number 7, you'd expect it to be Yellow Green, but Japanese naming conventions are really strange to us. Blue is green and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so um, it t- it's actually an, just an olive drab colour oh. and matches to FS4088, which I think is fairly close to US, one of the US olive drabs. And the interesting thing about the colour is that if you put against a green background, it looks looks brown. Put against a brown background, it looks very green. Hmm. So basically, it's it's an olive drab colour yep. and can look brown can or look can look or green. green yep. Yeah, so that the interesting thing too about that, uh, there were no uh, relics of that at one point and suddenly people come up, oh, we found this this relic of a Japanese brown. So we're showing it. Somebody <laughs> says, the, oh, they've looked at the pattern of uh, rivets on it. It's from a B-29 <laughs> and it was from a bit of nose art from the B-29 that happened to be brown. <laughs> so all excited. <laughs> something for nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing that's always intriguing me about the Zeros, the, uh, the, um, off the operator off the carriers, was, you know, in 41, 42, they were painted almost a white colour. Yeah, but they weren't. But they weren't a white? No. no it wasn't a true white? Yeah, the, the olive, the olive grey colour that we're not quite certain what it is, but we've yep. got relics of, is probably looks light. When you see it in, uh, in a, a black large and white form. photo, and yeah. also it apparently did. I've seen uh, black, uh, mm. photographs, colour photographs later on, quite looking quite light. But uh, when they're on a carrier, they look well looked after, and um, they will be shiny, mm. and they will be this other colour. For instance, there's reports at Midway of uh, seeing Japanese fighters in khaki. It's this colour because it can look a bit khaki. So it's it's a it's a difficult colour. A lot of people like Julian reckons it's ugly. But it's that's the colour they will paint. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that you're talking about that colour. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> it's a little bit like RLMO two, but more yeah. and a more bit darker and a bit, bit more browny. Browny. I'm yeah. pretty certain they they looked at uh, some German aircraft and said, "Oh, that's a nice colour." Colour. Yeah, we'll go that way. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> many of the interior colours that that's another another thing about oh, Japanese yeah. aircraft is interior colours. Oh yeah, Toki. Yeah. For a long <laughs> time, we thought it was that um, clear varnish tinted with blue. But oh, um, that metallic blue colour. That's right. Yep. Yeah, and now it's uh, well, we now that's that is the interior colour. It's not the cockpit colour. Ah. Uh-huh. So you'll find it down the back of the fuselage of zeros, but uh, not in the cockpit. It's a primer, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And the interesting thing is, like, it's this magical Japanese thing. But I saw recently a photograph of the production line P forties, and all the fuselages were all bright metallic blue, so the Americans yeah. were using it. <laughs> And some secret. Yeah. I don't understand <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, history is stranger than mm. fiction, isn't it? it is. Oh, it is, yeah, definitely. So, so so much knowledge is lost. I mean, people yeah. at the time would have known it, but it's went out of use. So people. Well, not so much that as well. I mean, you know, um, Japan was devastated by the bombing raids, so a lot of that sort of documents were just lost. Oh, it's so... Or it's destroyed after the war. Yeah, it's so spotty. That mm. some, some things there's great info on and others there's nothing. What about the aircraft that are in museums? Um, is that uh, Have they been able to go back and, and you know, have a, a closer look at the paint chips from, from those? They do, and, and there'll be fights over that as well. <laughs> because, you know, some people say, oh, it's definitely grey, you know, it's not, not that colour you... That brownie olive or the olive grey you talk about, yeah. But then you can buff it back, and it be suddenly becomes the olive grey. So, what's the consensus on the one at the Australian War Memorial? Yeah, Sabaru that's, that's too green. That it's is too green. green. Yeah. So that's um, there's there's sort of a bit of a camps thing. Mm-hmm. One one guy, uh, David Aiken from the US, uh, he's certain that they used this colour called MO, which was a, quite a green pistachio green colour. Yep. And, uh, in fact, Guy notes a, a company in Japan went along with that and they sell a paint that's that colour. But it, it is very green and sort of certainly looks wrong on a model and uh, just doesn't seem to match these other artefacts. But he's got, you know, they've got ideas saying this is it's this colour and it faded and went brown with age. And But, uh, the, like, Nick Millman's done actual, you know, testing, proper testing yep. on these things. And it's sort of, the pigments aren't there to be that colour. Mm. But... Uh, um, it's a minefield. It, it is. It's. I think it's worse than, than uh, World War Two German stuff, which oh, actually Messer looks quite ordered. <laughs> oh, Messerschmitts. Oh, yes. Um, That's a minefield now. So what, so what are you building currently and what of these nightmare hurdles have you had to deal with? Well, the things, thing I've got, I've got a couple of things on the go, apart from the T-34s. Uh, I'm building uh, the A6M2N float plane and that will be causing some problems because there's a lot of people, so there's another colour, <laughs> but maybe some Third zeros color. were painted, which was sort of like a, a more brownie version, which was could be this colour called 
I3, which was like a, a Suchi Iro, which is a, an earth colour. Now, some people say that Nakajima painted these planes that, and some people say, no, they didn't. <laughs> so uh, th- I will jump that hurdle when I come to it. Yep. But I, I think I'm probably just going to go with a standard um, green. olive grey colour. No, I can't say green, olive grey. Oh, olive grey, sorry, yep. So what are your main sort of um, websites you go to to get your information? Well, there's a, the sort of original, I won't say, was the best for a long time was jaircraft.com, yep. which was j, j-aircraft.com. And that used to be like everyone was there and it was heaps of stuff going on. But uh, Nick Millman uh, started up his uh, site called Aviation of Japan, mm. or one word, and uh, that's where the sort of majority of the, the best research seems to be coming from now. And a lot of the main researchers tend to uh, add stuff to that as well. Mm. So it's uh, those are t- two probably the best sites. There's also an, another site called Arawasi, yep. which is a, an, another blog site, and that's a strangely enough a Greek guy in Japan, and oh. he's he's, uh, he's really into into Japanese aircraft, yep. and he's he does some really starting to do some interesting stuff on there now. He actually puts out the Arawasi magazine, yep. uh, which is like a self-published magazine, particularly dealing with Japanese aviation. And he actually tends to like the interwar aviation, but civil aviation, which is a. I, I'd like to see more World War Two stuff. But there's been some really interesting stuff coming out of that as well. Well, before you leave, Don, I'm going to have to pick your brain because I've got a couple of one three fifty scale Japanese float planes right. operated off um, Japanese submarines. So I need to find out what colour green the actual green I should be using is for that scale. Yeah, one three fifty. Why not? It's probably one of six too. It could be. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure I'll find the right one. Oh, it's a, it's a, it seems to be like quite a crapshoot, isn't it? I mean, oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, but again, it's like you know, all m- at the end of the day, though, because like you, you got you got choices when you build models. You can build it to be as historically accurate as you can possibly mm-hmm. do. Yeah, you can build it to please yourself, or you can build it as a piece of artwork. Mm-hmm. And so, somewhere within those three categories, you're going to find something that. It's perfect just for you and what yes. you're intending. Agreed. Yeah, exactly. Or you just do it right. <laughs> 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 would, you, would you call yourself a, a rivet counter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with it. Well, I mean, it, uh, rivet counters make uh, good sources of information when you want the information. Yep. And good discussions over a beer as well. Correct. Mm. Too true. Doesn't <laughs> Too mean you true. have to build it to the way that they do it. but. Yeah. <laughs> For me, the best thing ever is to actually have an aircraft of the real thing you're doing. Or, sorry, a picture of the aircraft you're doing. Yep. Hopefully from all sides so you can see everything. And that way you can sort of have be more certain about things. I like to be certain. It makes me uncomfortable if I can't be certain. <laughs> 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 and we're always banging on about the fact you need to have, you know, lots of reference pictures as well when you're building. And oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can't go wrong there. All right. Well, thanks very much, Robert. Um Will you stay with us? Cause we're gonna have a bit more of a, a chat about something else shortly. For sure. And uh, hang around me. to the end. No. And um, you're certainly a wealth of information when it comes to Japanese paint coals. Never knew there was such controversy or discussions going on oh. out there in the modelling world over it. Never ending. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll be back very shortly. Okay, and we're back, and it's great to see Robert still with us. Um, Okay, some announcements. We've had quite a few emails from some of our listeners uh, recommending that we start up a new segment, which I think is an absolutely awesome idea. And what it's going to be is I'm going to get you, the listener, to actually send us emails or drop us a message on Facebook, just giving your tips as to what you do with a certain sort of uh, modelling technique. And we'll just um, have them out in a a little tips sort of segment. Good idea. I like Uh, tips. We'll start that off in our next show. Um, it's really great the feedback we've been good in, uh, getting so please continue uh, sending us uh, emails and again the email address is on the bench 64 at gmail.com last thing I want to touch on is I've just come across that there's they're going to be doing a remake of the movie Midway and I'm really excited about that we've got quite a few good movies coming out shortly We've got um, Tom Hanks is doing a movie, a series, I think you were saying, Ian, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, think, well, I heard he was doing a series on on Destro- US Destroyers. Yes. I think in, in the Atlantic. And Mel Gibson is doing a movie on a destroyer in the Pacific. Uh, one in particular, and I, the name escapes me now, 
It was a destroyer that was attacked about 17 times by um, kamikaze aircraft. So that'll be an in- interesting move to see that one come out. Yeah, definitely. So we'll wait and see because Mel certainly does his movies. Well, it's the realism side of things that I really sort of nitpick against. You it's know? hard being a model of watching films. It, well, <laughs> it's, let me tell you, it's hard being ex-military person yes. watching war films as well because... Um, the thing that really grinds my gears is when they throw a grenade and you see this great big whopping yellow flame coming out. And there were no yellow flames. In reality, it's just a little puff of smoke and a loud and bang. And a lot of shrapnel. We don't see the shrapnel. No. It's just a loud bang and a, and a little black, dirty puff of smoke and sort of, you know, that's it. And I think the people who sort of got it down pat are... Um, um, was in the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan, uh, the mini se- TV series um, the Pacific, and also what was that other Band of Brothers? Band of Brothers, Brothers. yeah, really good. yeah. Hacksaw, Hacksaw Ridge. No, no. Uh, came close, but there's a couple of again the, the the grenades with the great big sort of yellow explosions and everything, you know, and the artillery where they have great big sort of ex- yellow explosions. It just doesn't happen in real life. Well, what, what about hot shots? How does that... <laughs> <laughs> no. Hot shots. No. Yes. I saw... Um, I watched that Winston Churchill film the other day. Yeah. And it was... You know, why they had to change... I'm, I'll, I'll just put it out there. I'm not a big fan of Winston Churchill. Yes, I'll concede to our British listeners um, that he was a great wartime leader. But he certainly wasn't a uh, did Australia no favours during uh, the Second World War. Thanks, fighting words. Certainly <laughs> not during the First World War with his uh, Dardanelles campaign, because um, he didn't want to release the uh, Seventh and Ninth Divisions back home. That's right. Once um, Japan came into the war, he wanted them to stay in the desert, and um, our Prime Minister had a big sort of stand up Barney with him over that one. And sent it, send our ships back without. Escort. Yes, did a lot of sort of questionable things, but then that was um, Churchill, I guess. Mm. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we won't go no. under that. Got to get the good with the bad, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, there's also a couple of good um, aircraft movies coming out. There's that squad, uh, that um, three hundred three squadron, the Polish mm. uh, squadron in the Battle of Britain. That looks to be quite good. Yep. So hopefully um, that'll contain a lot of realism. I haven't sat and re-watched Dunkirk again yet, although it's now available on um, um, some of the pay-per-view sort of shows like Netflix and um, the other sort of channel we've got here in Australia. Yeah, wasn't a fan anyway. Yeah, I hated that. Did mm. you really? Yeah. Just as a film, I thought it was poor. I what what really appealed to me was when they're flying the Spitfire and. How he's doing the fuel calculations as as they're flying along with yeah. a bit of chalk on on the instrument panel. I thought that was you know, that's a real nod to sort of you know how they actually sort of worked. But yeah, I, I agree that you know the the Spitfire that he was flying seemed to Tom Hardy was flying seemed to have unlimited ammunition and mm. and the incredible gliding Spitfire at the end. Yeah, although which didn't actually have a motor because when it was burning <laughs> up, you could actually see a stick <laughs> holding the propeller in place. Yeah, well, the production values didn't have enough money, I guess, to sort of uh, <laughs> didn't have enough money for extras either. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, that's true. Oh, or even well. cardboard cutouts. <laughs> yes, I guess you're going to do with you can only do so much with the money you got, though, can't you? They use CGI for all the wrong things in many movies. A bit of CGI wouldn't have hurt them. Yeah, and. We still haven't heard anything about The Mighty Eighth, which was another TV series that Spielberg and um, Tom Hanks are doing together. I keep hearing it's either being filmed or, uh, or something. I don't know. I'm Apparently they've really spent $500 million on it. Have they? Apparently. That's what I've read. Jeez. So I hope they've got something to show for it after $500 well, there million. Also, there was also a rumour there was a uh, Flying Tigers movie in the works too. Oh, that'd be good to see. Mm, that'd be very good. Oh, would they get the Japanese colours right? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> would they use the, no. uh, the Tomahawks or would they use the P-40E Kitty Hawks? Well, there's a few, you know, uh, P-40, uh, P-40s for the sort of flying around there that they could use. Yeah, but they're not the Tomahawks. Yeah, well, that's true, I guess. But well, to yeah. the great unwashed, they wouldn't there's, really there's notice. There's one or two, aren't there? Yeah. But well, they wouldn't be flying. Oh, there's more than one yeah. or two. No, there's Tomahawks. Oh, Tomahawks is not. Yeah. But with, you know, with good uh, CGI... Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. L- like that uh, CGI of the, the kamikaze attacks uh, mm. you posted on YouTube. The other, or oh, that Chris did, yes. Yeah, right, that was excellent. Well, yeah. That's see, how it's done. Yeah. Well, see, one, one of the things that, as far as CGI goes, I mean, 
for those who don't know, if one of the recent movies that had Superman in it, apparently the actor wouldn't shave his beard. His so they so they um yeah, his mustache or yeah. whatever. So they CGI'd the bottom half of his face and it looks a bit weird. But if they can CGI uh, a, a moving mouth onto a human actor, right? Surely they could CGI the per- the proper cowling and stuff like that onto planes, right? So that we don't have to put up with those stupid bouchons in in mm-hmm. films anymore. I can't believe an actor is getting paid millions of dollars for a movie who refused to shave his moustache off for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it staggers me. You must be very attached to if it. If I was the producer of the show, I'd be saying, find, him, find me another actor. <laughs> Hold him down and shave him. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, dear. But then again, <clears throat> back of the old classic like Tora, Tora, Tora. That yeah. was great for its, for its time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, well, they actually used Donald Thorpe, who was like who wrote a book, in the 60s, a couple of books in the 60s about Japanese aircraft, mm. and they used him, so that's why the markings are right. Yep. And it's as, you know, they're a bit, they're pale grey, but that's what we thought zeros were back then. And of course, that was the uh, era where they still used models in Correct. filmmaking, well, yes. and they had these great big, huge sort of model aircraft carriers and everything. Yes. Yeah, they, they were actually auctioned a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple of years ago. Mm. They're massive, they were huge yeah. models. Yep, yep. Wow. Well, well, they they use models it? in Dunkirk, <laughs> right? The Dunkirk movie had models in it. They were very well done, yes. but then they didn't use it for other things, and yeah, and that's how you end up with Spitfires that have uh, the wrong exhaust on them, <laughs> visible in the shot, and <laughs> other oddball things that infuriated me. <laughs> like the old, like the old midway I mean, movie like, well, where the aircraft would change in flight about four times. Uh, like, like, yeah. when, whenever I hear like a World War Two movies come out, it's like, ah, oh, cool. Now I can go and scoff at something. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> that, that's how I see it. Wow. There's, there's nothing. There's always enough inaccuracies there that it just irritates me. Have you seen Battle of the Bulge? Yes, no. yes, yes. Yeah, watch. That's a model's delight. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thanks for telling me not to watch. It. <laughs> well, even the movie Fury. I mean, that drove me around the twist watching that. Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 there's oh, yeah, there's lots of things in that, isn't there? It just ended I mean, up I think being everyone's had an issue with that movie, right? It ended up just being like a cartoon at the end. <laughs> I didn't cartoon. watch it to the end. I stopped watching. <laughs> oh, you did the right thing. I should have. I, was, I think I went and saw it with Ian, actually, and I, I thought yep. I was disgusted with it in the end. Anyway. <laughs> disgusted <laughs> with it. Well, that's a Surprised strong Surprised you didn't walk out. <laughs> I took my ticket stub and I ripped it up at the end and threw it down in disgust <laughs> as, a, as the credits were rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, if this Midway film, if these guys haven't read Shattered Sword, and do what they said. Exactly. Yes. I'll yeah. stand up in the theatre and just shout, Lies! Yes. <laughs> yeah. Shattered yes. Sword has to be the, the def- best book. definitive mm. book on Midway. the Battle of Midway, for yep. sure. I, Absolutely. I would say not just on Midway, it's just for military history. So it's fantastic. Yeah. Mm. The way those guys sort of sat down and they've sort of carved up the battle, uh, the battle minute by minute by minute and, you know, can actually describe and work out what happened and why and all yeah. the rest of it. It's just a, a real credit to them. I mean, that's... That's good. Invest. It was almost investigative journalism, was, yeah. uh, you know, in the true sense of the word. Yeah, exactly. But they went back to the documents, the original yep. things, and it's all there. It is. Yep. Just goes to show you, doesn't it? Mm. You don't have to be lazy. No. <laughs> and you don't have to be Michael Bay either. <laughs> oh no, the movie that shall not be named. Those green zeros. Green, green zeros. Pearl Harbor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Pearl Harbor. No. Late, late war P forties. The <laughs> movie that shall not be named. No. <laughs> well, well, Kate looked good. Wasn't it just like <laughs> a like a like a World War Two version of um of Top Gun or something? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other one that's coming out soon. Top Gun Two. Yeah. So that's being filmed. Yep. I do like my modern jets. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll go and see it. How about the final countdown then? I enjoyed that movie. That's, I thought that's real. That's, that's a cracker of a movie. Yeah. Yes, that's a real cracker of a movie. Yes, well, I suppose the advantage of modern jets is it's much harder for them to screw it up. They try hard. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> well, I mean, you just have to go back and watch, uh, rewatch uh, the original Top Gun to see how much they can sort of stuff it up still. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, that's well, when they're nearly touching canopies, and there's just no physical way that would happen unless because <laughs> they just end up in a fireball. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing is, like, when they do sequels like that, they obviously got to sort of pay, pay I'll enough pay similarities to the original, right? Yep. I wonder if they're going to have an equivalent of that um, volleyball scene that everyone loads. Well, I suppose the ladies like it, don't they? 
And some segments of the male population probably enjoyed as well. Yeah, to each their own, I suppose. I don't even remember it. The volleyball segment. No. <laughs> okay. Well, it's you know men playing volleyball and okay. you know it's all the eighties. Yeah, all be there's all oil oiled up and right. um, yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's another great uh, podcast, and I think I've mentioned it before. It's called the um, the Fighter Podcast, and it's done by um, uh, gee, I've forgotten his first name. Um, Aiello is his name, and his uh, call sign. He's actually a next fighter pilot, Navy fighter pilot. Um, Jello was his uh, is his um, call sign. Yeah, and he's done about 20 episodes now on different parts of in regards to uh, fighter aircraft and extremely informative um, podcast so they they have said they're going to be doing one on on fighter jets and movies and they had a call out a little while ago on their facebook page uh, asking which movie they should go back and have a look at to um <laughs> to sort of pull apart and what's wrong with the whole thing and yep. everything but um it's really interesting getting his perspective on things, seeing that, you know, he was actually flying fighters off uh, the decks of uh, carriers and everything. So, yeah, go and check that one out. It's called the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Okay. It's good. really good. There's about 20 episodes out there now. I've enjoyed some of your other recommendations, so I'll look that up. Yes. All right. Well, I think that's about it. We're hard up against the clock. I think that's it for this episode. You guys Sounds got good. any any uh, comments to sort of sign off on? Well, for me, I'm saying if you're having fun modelling, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> 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 yes, I've got a, I've got a Gato submarine here to, uh, on the on the, on the table to prove that. <laughs> yeah, my my dauntless has given me enough trouble. I, I think I'm following that. that oh, how's the Yunkers go. going, by the way? Ian? I told you I'll put it back in the box. You told me, but you didn't tell the listeners, though. Yeah. yeah. What? Oh, you did. trouble. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. More beautiful than a mert. Yeah. Oh. It is. It's a hot rod. It's an ugly thing. It's a hot rod. It's like the Hellcat. Hellcats are hot rods. Beautiful aircraft. Hellcats are good, but. Beautiful aircraft. Yunkers D1. Yeah. Especially in the gloss <laughs> finish, it look really, look really hot. Yeah. 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 yeah, totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. That's it from me, Ian. That's it from me, too, guys. Julian. Yep, see ya. Man of a few words. And mm. Robert, thanks very much for being on the thanks show. For thanks, me. Robert. And that wraps up the show for this fortnight. But before we go, I'd just like to thank all of our people who have been supporting us on Patreon. By supporting us on Patreon, you are ensuring that we can keep this show ad-free. Also, your small contributions help us with our ongoing costs. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to Patreon forward slash On The Bench Podcast and you can make your small donation there. So until next fortnight, keep on modelling.